Good afternoon and thanks for coming to the 2019 Russ Rinsfield intern presentation. And first of all, I'd like to start, I'm Nancy Nunn, I'm with the Hughes Center for Agroecology and this is my colleague Sarah Everhart and Sarah is the managing director of the Ag Law Education Initiative. Um, and it's the two organizations that put this internship together. Uh, this is our third year, but I'd like to, as always, thank the Hughes Center for their support and also thank the Y family for making them part of our family for the summer. And Sarah, go ahead. Yeah, I echo all of those thanks. This would not, this internship would not be possible without the help of everyone at Y. The interns, as they'll tell you, they live and they work here, um, and so they are able to form nice relationships with all the folks here. Um, the Agriculture Law Education Initiative, in addition to valuing legal education of the agricultural community throughout the state, also um, puts a very high value on student outreach. We are trying to tra train the next generation of leaders um, and so this internship has been a wonderful opportunity for us to be able to do just that. So with nothing else further to say, we're going to introduce Michael um, and Victoria. Hello, welcome, and thank you all for coming. As Sarah and Nancy said, this is a jointly held internship by the Harry R. Hughes Center and ALEI, and the way that this internship works is it partners an undergrad in environmental science and a law student and that's really beneficial because a lot of our projects are a co-discipline I guess project so whenever I had issues with environmental science particularly acronyms that I didn't know Michael knew them and whenever we did anything with law that he didn't always understand I could try my best to explain it so it's a very good partnership between the two of us. So I'm Michael Marinelli. I'm currently going into my junior year at the University of Maryland College Park. I'm a double major in environmental science and English. I was drawn to this internship because I've reading the description and hearing about it, it seems really interesting how it brings tons of different stakeholders to the table to talk. Uh, policy makers, lawyers. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it was a really fascinating, really interesting uh, opportunity and experience. Yeah. And I'm Victoria Long. I'm a rising second year law student at the University of Maryland Carey School of Law. Um, I was drawn to this internship because I do not have any background in agricultural law other than a couple of food policy classes I took at the University of Delaware and I really enjoyed those classes and I had a science background so I wanted to do something that was going to use the background I had from undergrad but also use upon this new knowledge that I had from my first year of law school. And this coming year I'm actually going to be involved in the environmental law clinic at the University of Maryland so I'm excited for that as well. So we have four main projects that we worked on that were kind of prioritized. So we're going to talk about those four first, and then we're going to tell you a little bit about some of the smaller supplemental work that we did. Then whenever we would have a lull in these four main projects, we would kind of work on those. So the first one is forest mitigation banking research. We did a little bit of research with that. Then we did research into oyster aquaculture theft and created a little research report. Third, we, cre uh, we helped create a legal guide, uh, which is not yet published, not yet finished, but uh, to direct marketing for specialty crop producers. And lastly, we did research into Virginia's best management practice income tax credit program and helped create a report on that. So first off, uh, forest mitigation banking. Forest mitigation banking is uh, when a developer clears some land for something and they end up having to chop down some trees. The goal is to keep the number of trees in the county the same. So they, they, the goal is to try to plant them in the same area, but if they cannot, they can, end, they can buy credits for planting them from the county in another area. So every county goes about this differently. So we got in touch with every county to see, uh, to find out their criteria, um, to see exactly how everything works. And we helped Craig Highfield of the Alliance for the Bay create a comprehensive uh, report, little spreadsheet detailing everything about it. We also got in touch uh, with those planning and zoning people about uh, the Senate Bill 729, which was tasked for the Hughes Center to create a technical study so we, to get some information about tree canopy cover in Maryland. Next, we picked up where last year's interns left off, doing research into oyster aquaculture theft. Last year's interns attended a, a meet, uh, the Oyster Aquaculture Coordinating Council meeting and some subcommittee meetings regarding oyster aquaculture theft, which is becoming a bit of a problem. Tens of thousands of dollars can be stolen by harvesters at night, and so we wanted to combat that to protect those oysters, oy, uh, oyster harvesters who are not breaking the law. 
So two of, the, two of the problems are, there were many problems, but those included, uh, two problems included prosecuting those who are buying oysters from the harvesters who are stealing and addressing the harvesters who are stealing. So one of the options to address those who are buying, they're knowingly buying these oysters because of the time, that, the time of the year that they're getting these, these oysters. So we're addressing it by having a Maryland code that's for the knowingly buying purchase property to pr uh, use that Maryland criminal code to address those who are knowingly buying stolen oysters. Second, um, those who are stealing the oysters are harvesters. And so we address that by having the, when, those are when who, who, people who are convicted of the theft can be, um, people convicted of the uh, theft can have their license suspended or, or uh, revoked, or they can also have DNR police take their boat or their dredge so they cannot actually engage in the, the illicit activity itself. So we presented that to the Aquaculture Coordinating Council meeting this past July, and we got some feedback on it, and we represented it to Colby Ferguson of the uh, Maryland Farm Bureau. He is the head of, he's the current chair for this year for the ACC. So we got some feedback from him and we have that report basically finalized as of now. Another major project we worked on this summer was the Legal Guide for Direct Marketing for Specialty Crop Producers. And that's a very long title, but essentially what that means is a guide that outlines the risk and liability that farmers and other specialty producers face when entering a direct marketing relationship. And a direct marketing relationship can be anything from a roadside stand to a farmer's market to selling directly to a restaurant, which has become much more popular in the last couple of years since the farm to table movement has gotten a lot more momentum. So this guide um, cre was created as a joint project between ALEI and the Hughes Center. ALEI wanted to create a guide that outlined, obviously, the legal risks and liabilities that face these producers. And the Hughes Center also wanted to continue because this goes in line with their food shed assessment and also the overall goal to provide farmers access, greater access to market av avail availability. Excuse me. So what we did is a lot of other states have similar guides already in place. So we read the other states' guides just to get an understanding about what issues keep coming up. And we created a base guideline based on of that. And it had a lot of like federal, uh, implement federal legal frameworks, such as the PACA Act and the safety, Food Safety Act. And so we included that. And then we also were able to add more of Maryland-specific regulations. So depending on the county, depending on where you're having these local direct marketing relationships, it's all gonna change. After we did that, Michael and I were actually able to draft a couple of the sections. Personally, I got to work on the contract section, which was exciting for me because I really enjoyed my intro to contracts class. And so I got to use what I learned in the classroom um, in the real world, which is pretty exciting for me. The final major project we worked on this summer was a educative report about Virginia's best management practice tax credit program. So the way that this works is Virginia has had this program for about 20 years and it's not as well known. And they amend it every year, but the goal is to increase farmers' enrollment in best management practices on their farm and to incentivize them to put these best management practices on their farm. So this year, for example, the amended best management practices really reflected bay cleanup goals for Virginia. And so we created a report about how this tax credit program works. It's a tax credit on income tax. And we presented it to the Maryland Department of Agriculture as they are currently facing their phase three watershed implementation plan goals as well. And it's been pretty positive and we were able to talk to a lot of people from Virginia that have been involved with this. And it was interesting to learn about because I did not know anything about it. So those were our four main projects, but we did have, like I said, some smaller projects. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about two of them real quick. So one of them was working on conservation leasing. Uh, Sarah Everhart created a conservation leasing guide for farmers and uh, landowners to work together to implement uh, conservation on their leased land. And there was a workshop six months, there were workshops six months ago to help educate people about this. And we, we were helping to, last year's interns did some work with this and this is a long-term project. So we're kind of having our turn at continuing helping Sarah with this project. And so we mainly focused on getting in touch with those who have actually gone out and talked to other farmers and talked to landowners to educate them about it, to get some information because for grant reporting purposes, trying to get exact numbers on how many farmers, how many landowners were talked to um, and how many, uh, what's been done so far in terms of actually implementing uh, 
the uh, projects. And we also are excited that we're like kind of a cog in the machine for this, where we're doing something right now, but it's going to be continued in the future for years to come. And so we're really excited that we can help continue this project. Next was uh, the MDA strategic plan, which was actually like basically the first project that we completely did ourselves that we finalized, and that was really exciting to have done. Basically, we helped out jo Julie Oberg, the Dep deputy secretary of the MDA. We did research into three uh, food shed reports about food, uh, Maryland's food shed uh, and agriculture in the Maryland and Chesapeake Bay area. And we looked for farmer demographics, consumer information, nutrient regulation, and programs supporting agriculture. And so we looked for these, we created a little spreadsheet report detailing exactly what we found. We included the page number, obviously, so she could easily access it. We combed through hundreds of pages of these reports, and then we, we detailed a little bit of analysis or relevance or importance of it so that she, to, just to make her life a little bit easier so she knew exactly what she was reading and what she was getting into with each piece of information that we provided her with. So our final additional project that we worked on this summer was research into urban agriculture tax credit again. So Baltimore Office of Sustainability called us and presented us with the problem that the urban agriculture tax credit in Baltimore has only had one person that was able to apply and be approved for it. Because the way the language is written is if you have a parcel of land in Baltimore, if you use it for 100% agriculture, so you can't live on it, you can't have any other structure, then you can get this income tax credit. And that's why only one person has been approved. So she wanted us to look into other states and cities and counties to see if there was any other tax credit program that has been more successful than the one in Baltimore. So we started by looking at the city of Detroit because they've been sort of a front runner pioneer in terms of urban agriculture regulations. However, they don't have any sort of tax credit regulation. So we looked into Montgomery County actually has one that's different than Baltimore and Washington DC. In Washington, D.C., the way that they do it is if you have a parcel of land that you also live on, but part of it is for urban agriculture, you can get a 90% property tax income break on just the portion for agriculture. You won't get that for the par portion that you live on, but you will get it for the area where you're farming. And Montgomery County has something similar, where as long as the parcel of land, two-thirds of it is used for urban agriculture, then you can apply for the tax credit and become approved. So it's interesting to look into all these different areas. And I'm particularly excited about this project because it's something that the environmental law firm is going to continue looking into as well. Finally, we just wanted to take a moment also to highlight a lot of the unique aspects about this internship. So working at the Harry R. Hughes Center on the Y was an amazing experience for Michael and I, first of all, because we're both from Baltimore City. So this was very much a change of pace living and working here, but obviously very beautiful. And it was great also because we got to work alongside researchers, farmers, environmentalists, everyone that comes to the Y and affects these different policies. It was great to be working alongside of them. So if we had a question or we wanted to go out and see the farm, we could very easily turn around and ask someone to take us out there. Um, another unique aspect of this internship is that we were able to go on so many different field trips. So we went to Jenny Rhodes Poultry Farm. We went to a nursery field day. We had a day with the river keepers, which was obviously a lot of fun because we got to go swimming. Um, so that's really just been a unique aspect. And I think Michael and I both have area, particular trips that really affected us. For me personally is when we went to the Maryland Department of Environment and spoke with Suzanne Dorsey, who used to actually work here as well, and just talked to her about all the different areas and frustrations that come with policy making and getting the right people to the table so that you can have every single person that's represented in addressing a larger issue. So it was really cool to see how like one large issue can affect so many different stakeholders in different ways and finding that common ground and the collaboration that occurs there was really cool to see. Yeah, exactly. Like I said, the stakeholders, bringing stakeholders to the table was kind of what drew me to this internship. And like what Tori said, bringing stakeholders to the table can be difficult, but it can be rewarding. Uh, I found one day where particularly interesting where we went to, th we had three different trips in one day. So we, we went to the Farm Bureau to talk to Colby Ferguson of the ACC to present that uh, oyster aquaculture theft report, but we also heard what he does at the Farm Bureau. Then we went to the Maryland Department of Agriculture. We spoke with them about our uh, BMP tax credit 
uh, research. And then we also heard a little bit about what they do at MDA. And then lastly, we also went to the Chesapeake Bay Foundation headquarters and talked to a litigator and a, poli and a man who works in policy to hear what they do at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. So the, they, have, they all approach agriculture and the environment from completely different ways and completely different goals, but they still are brought together along with other, tons of other people to work together for a common goal. And that's really cool to see, especially that the Hughes Center really helps create that. So finally, we just want to thank everyone on this slide, particularly Nancy and Sarah. Thank you so much for all your guidance and for the opportunity that we had this summer. Yeah, it's been a real pleasure getting to know everybody here. I really enjoyed being able to turn around, talk to Lori or talk to uh, Nicole, and just hear what they have to say to get information from them and really just be passing by people who are doing completely different projects but still working together in this communal space. It's been a pleasure. Thank you all. So if you have any questions, we're happy to answer. Well, I'll open the question. <laughs> <laughs> it's legal, right? You're in legal business. <laughs> so on the first project about the, uh, was about the forestry. Mm -hmm. So one thing in agriculture that's always been a concern is, so if a farm gets developed, you lose the farm, the farmland. You lose your productivity. Well, if you put the development in a forest, then you have to plant trees somewhere. We don't need to plant trees in a forest where you plant the trees on farmland. Mm -hmm. So it always seems like the development strategy, even when there's mitigation, is uh, you know you lose cropland in the end. Is there a sense of the magnitude of how those different programs affect the loss of farmland? I don't know about the loss of farmland, but part of that project was also to give stakeholders an opportunity to use their woodland area. So if a farm already has woodland area, this is another way that they could increase their income. We didn't really look into the well, loss we of farmland. mitigation, right? Which right. You sort of say if somebody chops down some tree, they right. have to somewhere. Right. So it's just the question is, where, what's the land, in terms of where you say it has to be planted? Not forests are a good thing. I'm not forced <laughs> yeah. to that, but if you have to take, you don't have so many square feet to work with. So. Yeah, so it, it's private landowners who have forested area or want to plant forested area. Right, but you can't mitigate on something that's already forest, right? That does, you can't like just count it as mitigation. You have to create new forest? You can, you yeah. can do either. You can yeah. add two existing forests, or you can, depending on the county, of course, because every county is different. They all have different uh, ways of going about it. Some prefer to expand a forest by adding that number of trees to that forest, or they prefer to just create a new forest with that number of trees and expand upon that with others. So. It's very county dependent. And it's usually a ratio if it's an existing forest versus something that was newly planted. It's mm -hmm. like a two to one versus a one to one. So are they actually creating a forest or are they creating a monoculture? What, what are they planning? That's a good question. Um, we don't actually know, but we're not finished the project quite yet. Yeah. We have another week left. So maybe we can get you that information by next Friday. <laughs> it also depends on the county. So some really want like uh, non-invasive uh, habitat building for endangered species. And it, it differs. So some counties really care about the endangered species and planting trees that are going to bring up that population. Yeah, like so they make that a requirement. Yeah, like but Tori not said, all do. there's a lot of different criteria and some are planning in like greenway corridors to increase, to, to reduce the fact that, that it may be monoculture and just kind of, they have lots of different criteria to help reduce any environmental impact that a monoculture may have. So even if it is this a do half a dozen of the exact same trees, it's better than um, planting those in it in a uh, non-critical area, planting it in a critical area would help it regardless, so. Yeah, I think one of the big parts of the internship is to discover that, um, and we talked about this, there is no, oh, this is the way it's done in all 23 <laughs> counties, and here's the list, and, um, and I think through their phone calls even they found out, you know, in some counties it takes you three and four people. Yes three or four phone calls to figure out what's taking place and then you have to, so that's part of the whole experience. Yeah? With the forestry agriculture set up, did you get a sense of uh, diversity and perceptions of a private citizen using a public resource for private gain mm -hmm. versus a private citizen leasing the commons for agriculture production. Mm -hmm. Was that part of a conflict driver in there? 
We, so in the actual research itself, we didn't necessarily come upon a lot of that information, but we did go, we, follow, we followed Don Webster twice to Horn Point and to some o other oyster aquaculture field trips and to get a little bit of information. And that was definitely something that comes up of uh, the nimbyism, not in my backyard, uh, landowners not wanting to see oyster aquaculture in the public common space of the water that's right behind their house. And then uh, other harvesters having a problem with leased land when it should be a common resource. Mm -hmm. And we talked to Senator Eckert about that as well. So I understand the conflict of resource allocation, mm -hmm. but what about the perception of when the oysters are, are common? Even if you're planting them, I have access to them. Did you get that attitude or see any sense of that each? We didn't particularly, um, because we picked up where the other interns left off, we, didn't, we, we weren't able to have the opportunity to go to the original uh, committee and subcommittee meetings to hear the actual problems themselves. Uh, I have a feeling that did come up, though. Second question. Mm -hmm. did, um, day one versus today, what was your most eye-opening challenge? What the Hughes Center does. <laughs> I didn't really have a great sense. I knew that it was policy research, but I, d I wasn't entirely sure what a day-to-day -day thing would be. And there was no day-to-day -day thing, but I think for me it was really helpful to get really truly, even though in my interview Nancy really told me that it's bringing policy stakeholders, or agricultural policy stakeholders all together to talk and work together, but I didn't really have a true sense. It was really cool to see DLLC and the ACC itself and actually hear these discussions and to see that. How about for you? I would agree with all of that. Another eye-opening experience that I had was, particularly with forest forestry, um, I never thought of it as a crop. And that was one of the first things we learned, is that you can think of it as a crop because you replant it, you chop it down, re replant. And for me personally, whenever I thought about forestry mitigation, I was like, they're going to kill monkey trees in the Amazon. Like, that's all they're doing. So it was interesting to learn about the different aspects, uh, different viewpoints, and it broadened my horizons big time. I'll have to another one. Anybody else? Oh, no, on the, on the uh, oyster one. So if somebody takes oysters from a leased box, are they prosecuted for breaking the DNR oyster harvesting rules, or are they prosecuted as thieves? Yes. Um. <laughs> to both, yeah. Yes. <laughs> totally depends on the prosecutor, totally yeah. depends on the judge. Um, you can technically bring it under a criminal statute under Maryland law, but only if you can prove that the buoys clearly demarcated the area. But the problem with that is that it's very easy to cut buoys, so criminal charges have actually only been brought once in Maryland. Typically, it's a violation of a DNR regulation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which is much less of a penalty than being convicted as a It is. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things that Michael was actually bringing up, too, is that same statute, had, the criminal statute, has this portion about buying clearly stolen items, but that, and it's extended to the buoy markation portion of the DNR regulation, but it's not extended to buyers. So it's just a matter of extending it. How widespread is that? The, the theft? Yeah. We don't have uh, exact numbers just because we weren't at that meeting last year, but I do know that there can be like a, a large impact based on just one uh, action of stealing because it can be up to $10,000 worth of oysters stolen in one night. So that can be a huge dent in somebody's income. And oyster aquaculture itself is, is becoming a much larger market, and so it's, this uh, problem has been growing alongside the oyster aquaculture market itself. No more questions? I have a general question about your internship. Mm -hmm. So now that you've completed this internship, how do you think it's going to change your career path or your future studies or actions? I think for me, it's the bringing the stakeholders together. I know I brought that up like three times already, but it really is no matter what I do, it's, I'm going to value bringing everybody to the table because way more people are impacted by these decisions than one on the, someone on the outside may think. So it's really important to get not just the policymakers and the litigators, and, uh, but it's also important to get those who are affected by it, who are like the farmers and the, the, har and the, water and the harvesters. Like those people are just as impacted by these, or if not more impacted. And they don't always have a place at the table, but it's really great that they do have a place at the table here. And no matter what I do, I'm going to value bringing those, effect those most affected to the table. Yeah, for me, I mean, I just got off a 
semester of law school where you're defending with one client and the other side was just wrong, like just wrong. Like you are right and the other side is wrong. <laughs> and so it was interesting. I knew I didn't necessarily want to work in a law firm and this really solidified that for me. Um, just going in, understanding the wide range of a problem and how it can affect so many different people. Um, and personally just going through these different projects, although I really liked the policy, I really liked working on the direct marketing guide in particular because that just felt like that one-on-one -on -one relationship where you're really physically helping people so I'm going to be more looking into, I think, one-on-one -on -one relationships in the future. Yeah. Well, thank, well, you, thank all you all so much. <laughs> we have some cupcakes and ice cream for you, so I hope you enjoy that.